This is the fourth business that I've set up. I, the first one was in Hong Kong. Um, I have a gin company, which you can see there because I come from a family of gin makers, which um, most people find the most interesting thing about me, which always makes me slightly sad. But the benefit of it was I actually understood how clients feel about making something and getting it out to market. Um, and uh, prior to running Oyster Catchers, I ran a company called Haystack, which was really all about clients and agencies and running pitches. Um, so uh, Martin Sorrell used to call me Matchmaker Suki for years. Um, I had cancer about five years ago, um, and I'm fully recovered, which is good. But uh, as a result of that, I went onto the board of Macmillan. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about some of the experiences I've had from that um, and how that's broadened my understanding about the business world. Um, I've been the, the chairman of the Marketing Society and I've done a variety of things with the IPA, which is great. I'm also a member of WACL, which is um, some of you might have been to, some of you women might have been to some of the young things that WACL do, and um, I'm very proud to be part of that. Uh, I went to Leeds University and did drama to begin with, which was quite helpful when I had to stand on stages like this. Um, but I then did a postgrad in marketing and an MBA at Kingston Business School. And then from Calventry was given an honorary doctorate for doing absolutely nothing, which is great. So I go along there once or twice a year and um, wear my, my um, very beautiful gown and, uh, and lecture there a little bit. And then I have um, two children. I think you can see three of them there, but I have two children and a goddaughter that I look after most of the time, um, and a couple of little Kenyan boys that we look after in Africa. So that's kind of me. Um, Oyster Catchers is about accelerating marketing performance. Um, one of the things that we, we found, we work with the British Legion. I don't know, any, any of you know the British Legion? Yeah, um, the Poppy Day appeal. And we were, we were down there doing a briefing quite recently. And we saw a, a number of the, of the people who come out of recent war zones, uh, a lot of them with, with their arms and legs and various limbs or mentally scarred from the issues that they were in. And when one of the guys talking to them talked about this, which is performance is potential minus interference. And we use this at Oyster Catchers all the time to try and understand how we run our business, but also how we talk to clients. And I thought for you, actually thinking about your job, both internally and externally, you are able to perform by understanding what interference is there and getting rid of it. Your clients are also able to understand and perform at their best by getting rid of that interference. So as we go through, if you think about what those areas of interference are, um, that might be a way that you can help people reach their potential. We do four things at Oyster Catchers, um, and that's where I've kind of used that background for, for talking to some of the clients today to, to, to tell you what I'm going to say. Um, but we look a lot at models. Um, for us, one of the biggest changes in the, in the market at the moment is the changing model that clients are approaching, and I'm sure that all of you are feeling that, regardless of which agency background you're from. Um, everything's kind of getting closer and closer together, but also um, there's just some quite radical shifts in the market. Um, processes. I think when I was, an, if, if there was one thing that I would do differently, having been an account handler all those years ago, it would be around process and financial management, because I don't think I had a clue, frankly, when I was a, an account handler. Um, but it's absolutely at forefront of all the clients that we work with now. Um, we do lots on partnerships, and I'll tell you quite a lot about that as we go through in the next 20 minutes or so. Um, and then we launched an academy two years ago, so we do a lot of work with clients now on training them to be better marketeers and looking at marketing excellence and what that means. So, um, and we work with lots of lovely clients. Some of them I'm sure you work with as well. Are there any, can you put up your hand if you can see a client that you work with on this list? Yeah, so that's about half. So I probably know about half of your clients. So that's good. Um, for this, we spoke to seven of our marketing directors and asked them three questions. And then and you'll see actually on the list there's eight because I spoke to one of them yesterday and took them through this presentation to say, did, they, did, they, did it resonate with them? Um, and so we asked them three things. What are the main challenges facing you as a marketing director? 
What are the most important ways that your agency could help you meet those challenges? And what are your views on the main challenges facing you and how you're going to de develop your career? So I thought those were three questions that if you knew some of the answers to, might help you go back and what did you say today? Think of something differently, be, be inspired to try to be different. Okay, well, we'll see at the end whether, whether you've learned something. Um, right, so the first one, the first comment they came back with was um, measuring effectiveness. Um, as I said, how many of you have done a financial degree? One, two. Or, or had a module in your degree that had a finance or stats part to it? Okay, that's good. Keep your hands up, keep your hands up. How many of you subsequently have done any form of financial courses? Okay, if there is one thing that you get out of today, find a financial course and go on it. Um, because the difference for you in the future and the difference for your clients in the future is understanding and manipulating numbers. Now, you're not, I'm not asking you to be financial directors, and anyone who knows me, Victoria, um, will know that you know, I'm not. But it is something that will make the biggest single difference to your clients and to yourselves and for you to be able to do whatever job it is that you want to do in the future. Um, clients are now much more obsessed with understanding the numbers, understanding the effectiveness. So I was talking to Abby yesterday about how she was going to change, having gone through a big pitch process, how she was going to change what she's going to do and make it work within the organisation. So we were looking at a number of um, fact-based changes that she wants to make to structure. So I gave her some, some questions to, to ask and she's actually taken as her mentor within the organisation the financial director of British Airways, which is a pretty key thing for a marketing director to do within an organisation of that type. Um, so we went through the facts and we went through how she was going to enable that change to happen by looking at the numbers rather than just saying, you know, this is going to make a big difference, the creative is going to drive the change that we see. Because actually everyone outside marketing in their organisation is not thinking about marketing. They're thinking about, you know, the, the bottom line and the difference that it's going to make. So the more that you can do that to help your clients, the better it will be. I am absolutely amazed at how little grasp of the financial aspects of running the business that most account handlers are. So, for example, I was working with a retailer, um, I am working with a retailer, and we went to see the agency, and, and indeed the client, so this was not, this is not a one-sided thing, uh, I don't know, a couple of months ago, to go through the numbers on the account, and it's a really big, significant million pound account, and actually, there was uh, a reconciliation from Christmas that was going to be given back to the, to the client of half a million pounds in April. So there's a financial discrepancy of half a million pounds. That's part of the way that they've set up the business. But actually, in my book, I don't think there's anyone who should have 500,000 pounds that is not reconciled um, quicker than 20 weeks. Doesn't seem like a very good thing for me. If I, and that just some basic questions. I think the other thing is when you're going through the financials and you're helping clients on that, make sure you have all the facts right. Now, one of the things that we measure when we sit in status meetings is how many times people put up charts that have inaccuracies, inaccuracies in them. And on the whole, basic account management with financials on them will have at least three. And if you're doing more than that, then you're, you know, you're, you're worse than average. But, you know, kind of in my book, I think if you're having a numbers conversation, you'd expect most of them to be right. I can absolutely guarantee you that in, an, in a client organisation, if those numbers are wrong, they wouldn't be allowed three mistakes in a board meeting or a big presentation. So that's my little lecture about finance, but I, I honestly would try and, try and do that. Um, one of the things that I do at Macmillan is uh, I sit on the finance committee which is quite an anathema for me. And frankly, when I first went there, I didn't understand a word they were talking about. You know, and I'm kind of, I've run businesses for 15 years, but because of the way that a big um, charity runs itself, it's all about debt. Um, we have three chief execs from three of the big financial institutions sitting on the board, so they clearly know what they're going to do. Um, so I just went to the, 
chief exec of Scottish Widows a few weeks later and had breakfast with him and said, OK, these are the ten things in this last meeting I didn't understand. These are the five things that I don't really get. Um, and this is what I think this means. Could you help me fill in all the gaps? And he was great. He thought it was, he thought it was quite fun. And then he, he will do the same and say, actually, I don't understand this stuff about the branding things that you're talking about. So there's always a, a pros and a con. How many of you have had um, have regular one-to-ones with your finance director in the agency? Good. OK. Well, I would suggest that you try and go and do those a bit more often and, and, and shock them that you actually are, are interested in what they want to say. OK, so that's measuring effectiveness. Um, influencing individual stakeholders. Have any of you read the Jim Riley book? On It's called uh, Managing Stakeholder Power and Influence. It's a slightly dry book, um, but it talks about uh, the way that you look at stakeholder management. So it talks about high-level power versus low-level power, high interest versus low interest. Um, and, it, and it plots people on a, you know, on a quadrangle and it basically says if it's high power high interest then you've got to be all over them like a rash and if it's low power low interest you can probably ignore them um, you know that's that's not that difficult to work out is it really but I think understanding about stakeholder influence is important I think it's important for yourselves within an organization how many of you um, put up your hands if you think you're better at managing upwards rather than downwards One. Tell me if you think you're better at managing downwards rather than upwards. Okay. Uh, um, t put up your hand if you don't really think about it at all. Okay. Well, that's very honest. Um, I think that for clients, they're obsessed with internal stakeholder management because they can't get anything done without understanding who they're going to do. And, and if you work with big organizations, actually one of the massive frustrations is, is they all spend all their time second guessing about who the top, the top man's going to think about. So, you know, if I look at somebody like Sainsbury's, Actually, they don't do it so much in Sainsbury's, but they used to when they were under threat. Everyone would, would try and think about what Justin King was going to say, or uh, at the time, Helen um, and now Sarah Warby. So they don't actually go and ask the question because they can't, because that's not the structure that they have. Similarly, in agencies, I think that, that you know, the, the, the joy of being in an agency is they tend to be pretty collaborative and open. Um, but actually, the stakeholder management within an agency is quite challenging. Um, it, just tell me who, who is your most challenging person to, to deal with internally? A, an individual, a department? Creative? Creative? Yeah? yeah? Oh, God, it used to be mine. I used to work with Trevor. Do any of you work with Trevor Beatty? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so Trevor Beatty, does everyone know who Trevor Beatty is? Yeah. So Trevor, lovely, very, very, very brilliant creative director, and I worked with him at TBWA. But he would... Uh, and I was the new business director, so he would lock himself in his office just before a pitch. And sometimes, if he hadn't actually cracked the idea for the pitch, he'd lock himself in the office for several days. And we were doing a pitch for, uh, for a newspaper one time, and he hadn't come out of the office. We had an hour before the clients were coming in. So I went to the chief exec, having told them for about the last four days, I had no idea what we were going to do. And eventually, they had to go and break the door down and get him out. <laughs> Actually, he did an amazing presentation. We didn't win it. But we didn't win it because he did some brilliant creative that didn't link at all to anyone's thinking within the whole organization. And after that moment of meltdown, I just thought, right, this is absolutely not working. So we're going to change strategy. And I then used to take him for lunch once a, once a month. And uh, we would go to the same restaurant. We would have steak and chips and a bottle of red wine. He would eat about that much of steak, about that many chips, and half a bottle or three quarters of a bottle of red wine. And then we always knew what was going on. And we had then a brilliant relationship. And I saw him the other day, actually, we were laughing about it. But that was my way to be able to work with him constantly because it was such an important one. Um, you know, clients here are talking about what can they do internally, how can they stakeholder manage, and what can you do to try and help them make sure that they're having the right conversations. And again, fact-based information rather than just information based on, well, I like it, or our gut feel is, or the creative director says. That's, that's helpful, but not helpful enough for them. Practice active listening. Um, my mum always says she... 
she's, uh, she always says, whenever she has a conversation, she counts how many questions she asks versus the other people asking her. Now, if anyone knows my mum, apart from Victoria, uh, would know that she's amazing at doing this. So she gets people to basically say everything and anything that they can about themselves. Um, and active listening, as you all know, is different from just listening and not doing anything. It doesn't mean you have to passively always say yes, but it does mean listening to what the client says. When I was doing the Tesco pitch a couple of years ago, we had um, three chief execs, one of which was Benny Higgins, who was the Tesco bank chief exec. And um, before we went into the pitches, I kind of gave them a briefing, spoke to Phil Clark, who's the chief exec of Tesco, told them, you know, these agencies work really hard, all the normal stuff. Be nice, listen, be, ask interesting questions. Y you know, they're agency people, so be kind of chatty. That would be good. Um, after the first meeting, Benny had sat there the whole way through without smiling. He asked two or three really quite challenging questions, and then that was it. And after the second one, he did pretty much the same thing. So I said to him before the third one, look, Benny, it's, it's slightly off-putting because you're not really smiling, you're not really engaging, and he's an amazing, amazing man. Um, and he said, Suki, you have to understand, I don't want the agency people to like me. I want to listen to what they've got to say. So if I smile and engage with them, they think that I like them and I'm not interested in what they're doing. But actually what they're doing and what they're going to be able to do is hopefully save my business. Now if you see, you know, Tesco's are still down 3.7%. You know, that appointment of Widens is critical in their turnaround. So they had three agencies and he felt, and still does, that it's important that you listen, you don't just smile. So for me, I thought that was, that was quite a, a, a good, uh, I try and remember that. Um, and it is amazing that how often, particularly when the stakes are really high, we forget to listen. So I was going through with Abby yesterday some of the, um, the pitches that they did in BA. So, you know, for all of those you know, the, the pitch lasted about nine months. Um, that's pretty big, isn't it? You know, it's kind of like one of the biggest pitches that we've had in the last year. Um, and one of the agencies did not listen to the brief. They presented a campaign that didn't have fly to serve at the heart of it. And the single biggest question in the brief was, what are we going to do with fly to serve? She kind of go, how can you do that? So you knew any of you, you my, she, my daughter could sit in that presentation and say, but the brief says fly to serve and you haven't done that. But somehow when we're involved in it, we just get it wrong, don't we? Because we forget to listen and we forget to think and we forget to stay, take a, a step back. And I think actually for you, where you're not sitting necessarily at the chief exec level and you've got a bit of a chance to, to think rather than just do the whole time, you, you can be the kind of conscience of, of the business. Um, we had a situation a few months ago where we were doing a really big presentation to Barclays and um, Katie Hicklin was one of our project managers. Fantastic. And it was a really high pressure meeting. So my business partner Peter and I went in, it was all the senior Barclays people, we went through the whole strategy, quite challenging stuff. And they asked us a question and we answered it. And we answered it wrong. We, Peter and I just got it wrong. And afterwards, Katie said, uh, you know, that's not the right answer. This was the right answer. And, and we said, but why didn't you tell, you tell us? She said, I did. I told you. I told you three times. It's written in a deck, but you didn't listen to me because I'm young and I'm the, I'm the project manager. I didn't keep telling you. I didn't kind of stand in front of you and go, you are about to make a really big mistake and you're going to get fired for doing it. And, and she didn't say it in the meeting. I'm not even sure she was there in the meeting, but she didn't say it. And, you know, so for me, even then, I think, my God, I, I want to listen to anyone. I don't feel, she's certainly not scared of me. Just, we just didn't listen. And we nearly got fired from that business for that moment. In fact, it was fired. The client said, if we didn't like you so much and trust you so much, we would have fired you. But luckily, you can carry on. <laughs> oh, my God. It's not great, is it? I shouldn't really tell you all these things. I should pretend we're massively professional and we're always right. But sadly, we're not. Um, demonstrating teamwork. Um, 
I think this is the second most important thing that clients talk to us about at the moment. Um, it is, as, as the, the, the kind of marketplace for agencies is changing, being able to work in collaboration, being able to work collectively together is absolutely critical. Um, and, and actually, I feel quite concerned when I hear clients quite flippantly saying, oh, well, of course, X, they don't collaborate, do they? They're not that kind of agency. Um, it absolutely, I believe, comes from the top. So, you know, if senior people don't collaborate, then it's very difficult for everyone else in the organisation to collaborate with other agencies outside. Um, how many of you work on accounts where you've got multiple agencies in the mix? Okay. How many of you know at least three mobile phone numbers and have them on your phone of the key three counterparts of those agencies that work with you? Good. Fantastic. It's really good. I was with a client yesterday who was having this, this issue and said, um, well, it wasn't yesterday, but, um, and said, they phoned up the chief exec of one of the agencies and said, I'm not going to tell you to phone the chief exec of the other agency, bearing in mind they've worked together for the last two years, uh, but I am going to advise you to do this because I want this fixed. I want to stop this squabbling. I don't want it to happen anymore. And the chief exec of the agency said, yeah, well, I haven't got a phone number. And it, you know, it's not good enough, is it? So I think having the phone numbers and making the phone calls is really, really important because clients really want you to do that. And if there is one thing that you can do and help your agencies do, is work in collaboration with other people. Um, and they will really, really, really benefit from that. And they will love you as leaders to be able to take that initiative. Um, we have a, another joke in, in Oyster Catchers because do any of you know my partner, my business partner, Peter Cowie? Yeah, massively eccentric, wonderful, amazing. And, and Peter has amazing skill at getting people to like each other and work together. And that's why he's so brilliant at running pitches. But he also loves everyone. So he, you know, absolutely opens his arms to all our competitors, everyone else we work with, people that have upset us in the past. And, and I find that quite hard. You know, I, I'm quite, I find it quite hard sitting and chatting nicely to all the other competitors that are trying to eat my breakfast. But, you know, we have to do that. Um, but I think certainly when you're trying to work in collaboration, putting your arm around them is, is the most important thing to do. Um, <laughs> you know, it's so obvious, isn't it? Hire smart people. Um, and, and I love this quote, sometimes we're the smartest people in the room, I don't like that. You know, I have to say, I feel like that. Whenever we're doing, we, we, we evaluate lots and lots of client agency relationships. Um, and we look at five skill sets. So we look at the people, then the teams, um, the creative, the thinking, the process and the financials. And when I'm sitting and doing interviews or I'm sitting in meetings and I spend lots of time with, with actually mostly more senior people in agencies, um, if, if they're kind of not saying something that I don't know, I always feel slightly let down. You know, I want to be with people that I think, I couldn't do that job, or that's something that I'm learning, or that's something that's different. So we do do that. I think the other thing to do is to spend time with people that you don't normally spend time with. So uh, we hired a new guy this week, um, and we've gone through a stage now of hiring a number of management consultants. How many of you have management kind of ex-McKinsey or LEK kind of people in your agencies? One. Um, okay, so they're, they're quite different beasts. They're sort of a combination between procurement and um, obsessive planners, and, and they work really, really hard. So, um, so we've, we've done this over the last year and we've had a number. We, we brought our new boy in on, on Monday. He's, he's out of LEK. And, you know, it's so interesting because they sort of, they, they don't completely fit in. You know, he, he looks a little bit more uh, like an accountant rather than uh, a consultant or our kind of consultants rather than, um, they are, but they're different. And, you know, one of the manifestations of that is they were doing some interviews yesterday. So Justin was doing them and, and Jackie, who's one of our partners. And last night, 10.30, I have the deck from Justin because that's come through. And then uh, I have um, some financial input from one of the other people who was doing that, some team. And then at 8 o'clock this morning, I get the stuff from Jackie. So 
but completely different. And actually, you know, I can always rely on them to turn stuff around in an instant, to always do charts in a particular way. So working with different people um, will give you a different perspective. And, and, I, and again, I think that if you don't get that from, your, um, from where you are in an agency, go and get it outside. Go on other courses. So I think these kind of courses are brilliant because they make you better at your job. But I would also look at doing other courses. You know, when I went to do my MBA, I went to my chief exec, I was about 25, 24, um, and I went to my chief exec at the time, and mostly because I was really bored. It was the worst time of my whole life. It's the most boring time, isn't it? You know, when you've kind of been in an agency for a few years and you basically can't do anything really grown up, but you get to do all the rubbish. Do you remember that time? Yeah, no, obviously you all have had great times, unlike me. Um, so I went to do my MBA and, and I went to my chief exec and said, would you pay for me to do my MBA because, you know, you pay for everyone else to do the kind of industry courses? And they said, no, we want you to do an industry course. Bearing in mind, it's quite a long time going now. Um, so I said, that's fine. I'll pay for it myself. And at the end of the course, you have to do a thesis. So I went to three of my clients. In fact, I went to two of my clients, one of which was M&S Financial Services, um, and then I went outside to a client that we'd never worked with and said, I'm thinking of doing my thesis on women and financial services. Would you be interested in it? Would you pay for the, for the report and have some input into it? And they went, yeah. I went, oh, that's good. So they paid for me to do my MBA. But the benefit of that was the moment I did it, I met everyone from all sorts of walks of life that were not to do with my kind of life. Um, and actually, I, I still keep in touch with quite a lot of them. But it just gives you a really different perspective and it makes you a smart person. And it makes you the kind of person that, that clients want to spend more time with rather than just doing the job that you're doing um, really, really well. Um, creating trust. We, we have a, a club at Oyster Catcher School, the Oyster Catcher Club that Vic runs. Um, and every other month we get about 200 people that come along from the industry. So a number of your chief execs or heads of planning. Um, and we get, we, we get senior clients, so marketing directors, managing directors. And we had one um, last month that was about trust and brands. Um, and we had Benny Higgins, who I talked about earlier. We had um, Johnny Hornby, who was the chief exec of what was CHI. Um, we had Alistair McCrow, who's the head of um, marketing for McDonald's. And we had Steve Parrott, who's the chairman of Crystal Palace Football Club. And they were all talking about trust. And actually, it was a really interesting evening. If you go onto our website, you can see a short three-minute film about some of the output on it. And there's a slide share. But for me, it was, it's such a critical part of their job now and what they're doing. So at one level, it's about trust in the brand. Another level is about trust within the organisation. And they all talked about um, the authenticity. So Johnny sort of talked about you need to earn trust through your behaviour. Don't crave trust through the media. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of chat about how much do people trust you? How much are they going to give you opportunities and benefits? Um, I mean, I think that this piece around authenticity is really key and, and understanding what you are and helping clients to just see a, a consistent approach to, to knowing that you are going to be able to do what you say you're going to do and be able to respond in the most appropriate way. Um, and I think the other thing about creating trust is that, that, that they know that they can rely on you and that you can rely on other people. And so think about you know, how, how you can make that happen and how you can show and demonstrate trust within both your organisation and externally. And often, if you speak to people who have gone into very senior jobs, they will talk about the area and the level of trust. So Justin King will talk about the fact that 10 years ago when he ran Sainsbury's, came to Sainsbury's, now if you look at his board, of the, of the 12 people on his board, 11 of them have been there for the whole of the 10 years. And he trusts them implicitly, and they trust him. So, um, you know, I think in, a, uh, in an age where it's very easy to say, of course you've got to trust me, earning that trust um, is pretty critical. Um, 
Invest in understanding my business. Now, this is one that I have lots of conversations with agency chief execs about because the money isn't there anymore. So when I, you know, first was an account handler, we used to get kind of like a day a week or half a day a week to go off and think about the client and go and go into stores and just be part of that because the margins were bigger and it was easier to do. I think it becomes much more challenging now. Um, and actually, if you're really going to understand your client's business, you probably have to do it off your own back because you're not really going to get given the time during your day. Um, but I do think that actually eating, drinking, being around the brands that you work in seems like an absolute obvious thing to do, but doesn't always necessarily happen. But I think also not just the brands that you work on, but the brands within the agency. Um, so just... Put your hands up if you have eaten, drunk, experienced one of your brands that you work on in the last day. Okay, in the last week. Okay, in the last month. Yeah, pretty much everyone by a month. You know, I think if you ask the same question to a bunch of clients, of course they're there because they're living it, but they do do it. Um, you know, and one of the things when we do our evaluations, we will talk to all the account handlers and we will say, have you, you know, if you work on McDonald's, do you go to McDonald's regularly? Um, we often have our meetings when we're doing our interviews in McDonald's. And, and even though there is an amazing, of all the clients and agencies that we evaluate, that is the strongest relationship that we evaluate. We've evaluated for five years and we can see it grows and grows. Um, but even with that sense of loyalty, there's still... You know, we, ha we had an account handler about a couple of years ago who went, oh, no, I don't eat McDonald's because it's shit. It's not a great thing to say. But, you, you know, but again, it's so easy to do. But you wouldn't see it there in a client saying that kind of thing. So it feels like it's a no-brainer. But just make sure that your teams, so you yourselves, but even more importantly, your teams are experiencing what the brands are because that's what they want to know. Um, and then also trying to put on, trying to show that you really, really care. So, you know, again, how often do you talk to your clients as, um, as there's a moment of something happening in the press? So, you know, something for like Tesco's, frankly, I seem to speak to my clients every day and there's the next crisis. Um, but other clients that we work with, it's, it's more challenging because there isn't stuff that's a kind of big critical thing. But to try and think of what those opportunities are, to try and find ways of understanding them, asking them different questions rather than just what's the creative answer or what's the, you know, what's the next digital campaign going to be. Um, I just thought I'd show you this, which was about understanding a business. Because the other part of it is you might just think about how can you understand their business as a whole. So this was for... Um, quite a large international retailer, uh, that had about 400 agency relationships worldwide um, and had about 46 in the UK. So I mean, actually one of the things that we said to them was they didn't even know that that was the number. They didn't know that they had that many agents because they've got a number of different business units and their business units don't talk to each other. So one of the things that you might find if you work for a big business is you talk across a lot of the business and you don't ever... Um, they don't ever talk to each other. So when I was doing some business with Barclays last year, the first time that the marketing director from um, Barclay Card and the retail division sat in the same room, bearing in mind they both worked in the business for about three years, was in a meeting that I held. So I invited them to come to a meeting and talk at the same time, and they'd never met each other before. So, you know, don't underestimate the power that you have within that kind of organization. But just to, you know, for, for a perspective to say, um, look, you, you're doing all these kind of things. So we just said, look, you've got all those agencies. doesn't entirely make sense. And they're not all talking to each other. And then there's a whole load of factors underpinning that that doesn't seem to bring marketing efficiency. And what you're talking about is trying to get to a marketing efficiency. So um, just, just being that external lens for them made a really, really big difference. Um, understanding my growth drivers. Um, I don't know if that's a question that you ask your clients, but actually when, when this came back as a question or an answer from us, I thought, well, that's interesting. I'm not sure that I actually know every growth driver for all our clients. You know, I'm not sure I could crystallize it for all of them. Um, so uh, I think it's quite a good question to ask. 
Um, and I'm, in fact, I was, I was speaking to um, Ronan Dunn at O2. And so I said to him, I sent him a text, actually, said, what are your growth drivers? Because I thought, well, I wonder if I know. And he said, average speed per customer retention. That's the first one. That's about reducing churn. Um, so that in, and they are just trying to look at it. Every single touch point, how do they reduce that? Um, Customer-based growth, so obviously acquisition. And then business to business, business to customers, opportunities and partnerships. So those are their three growth, growth drivers. Didn't actually mention the brand, didn't mention creativity. But within that, why O2, which is the, which is the bit that all the agencies are looking at and the bit that, that their marketing teams are looking at, is a critical part that's sitting underneath it. But actually, if you turn that around and look at, you know, so if you think about the questions that you're, that you've got with clients and understand what are the growth drivers, that's a different lens to put at it. So one of the things that we're talking to BA about is rather than having your weekly, monthly status meetings, why don't you have a growth meeting? So why don't you on, an, on a monthly basis look at, look at your campaigns, look at what your growth drivers are and look at them by that lens and see what difference that makes because that actually may make you make the decisions about where you put your money, how you're bringing your teams together where you want real and true collaboration. So um, you might want to think about that. You know, the, uh, as you know, there are no facts, are there? There are only guesses. When we make that challenge to ourselves, when we make that challenge to the clients, all you can do is guess. But as all of you know, if you, if you write a business plan, if you write a plan, if you make assumptions, it's much more likely to happen. Um, we always joke, and, uh, at Oyster Catchers that isn't amazing that we always meet our plan and we always go slightly over it. Quite good that. Maybe if we did a bigger plan we might get there quicker. But um, one of the challenges that, that the other, so the kind of the third biggest one that the client said to us was just help me think ahead. Um, I thought that uh, Peter Drucker's com comment about culture each strategy for breakfast was a good one about thinking ahead. You know, is it, is it about changing the culture? Is it about the strategy that you've got? Is it about just thinking about small things differently? Um, what is it that you can do? One of the things that we measure when we're looking at partnerships is that kind of proactive behavior. The agencies always say, look, we're really, really proactive and the client never buys any of our ideas. And the clients always say, and agencies never to come up with anything proactive. But actually, it's about coming up with ideas that are relevant and selling them in in the right way. Uh, and equally, for clients to listen when agency people come up with really innovative and different ways of thinking. Um, but, you know, they say here, I need agencies to think five years from now, how can we steal a march and yet without throwing away what we have? So again, I think if you don't have clients that do regular meetings where they're forward thinking and they're including you in on it, um, and, and for some of our clients, we do that quarterly. Some of them are monthly, depending on how fast they grow. I would suggest that you try and make that happen. I think also within your organisation, you know, you as a team, you as your, as your agency, if you can be part of doing that, then you're much more likely to, um, to get into that area of growth. So... That was, those were the questions we asked our clients. That's what came back. Uh, I hope that was interesting. I hope you've written a few things down that you might be able to think about today. And, and we've now got half an hour, 20 minutes, whatever. 20 minutes to answer some questions. I'm really happy to talk about this. I'm really happy to talk about anything, pretty much. Um, anything about the stuff you saw about me at the beginning. Ask whatever you like. Um, so you talk a lot about how models are changing. Yep. What do you think, from all the conversations you're having with clients at the moment, is the dream model for a client? <gasps> well, luckily, there's no dream model. It's a good out. <laughs> because it depends. So, Abby would say the reason that she's gone to BBH as one agency, um, well, alongside some other stuff sitting around it, is because internally they have so many stakeholders that they simply couldn't manage big relationships. So two big fundamental relationships sitting at the core of what they were doing just meant that the stakeholder management was impossible and they weren't getting brand consistency. So that was her overriding reason to do that. Equally, um, you know, if I look at Land Rover Jaguar, they've got two agencies, they've got two brands. They like having two agencies. You know, they like having YNR, they like having Spark 44 because they work, they don't particularly compete against each other, but 
you know, they feel that there's an obvious challenge there. So that sort of works quite well. If I look at McDonald's, um, which has actually got a really quite traditional Leo Burnett, um, uh, the marketing store, Razorfish, you know, very traditional, but that works really well for them because, you know, they, they try and bring the planning forward and make it work. I think that what is interesting is, is the kind of naked model that we had from years ago where Naked came in and really challenged the marketplace, um, thought about media in a different way, thought about thinking in a different way. I do think that clients are looking for that upfront thinking challenge much more than they ever were before. Um, and, I, and I think that there is, a, there is a strong desire for clients to get that. Now, whether they get that from their existing partners or from a new partner um, is something that they are much more prepared to look at. And then I think the back-end production piece where we had, you know, even two years ago, decoupling was a really uncomfortable thing for most clients to do. I think you'll see almost every key client in the next 18 months to two years will go to the decoupling model because actually they now recognise that the value in production for them is important, they can make big savings by doing it, that the, the control, the platforms that are created, you know, the amount of money invested by companies like Tag and Hub Plus and Hogarth has been extraordinary and actually almost no agency can replicate that. So I, I think it's those two ends where there are some consistencies and quite radical change. I think the bit in the middle kind of suits whatever the client is. Okay. Hi, I'm Steph from Maxis. Um, as agencies, it's sometimes frustrating when you see that feedback because you know that's how you need to behave and that's the way you want to behave. Mm. Part of the responsibility is for clients to change the way that they work with their agencies. Mm. What's your best advice on how to hold that mirror up to your clients and push back to them? Uh, do you know what I think it is? I think you have to escalate it right up to the top. I hate saying this, but so when we looked at Barclays, across their main key agencies, and there's some of them here, uh, we found out that 42% of all projects were started without a purchase order. Now, in its own right, not having a purchase order is not a massive big deal, except it is a big deal. Because if you don't have a purchase order, you don't have a client taking your business seriously. You don't have them writing a proper brief. You don't have them linking in with procurement to get the purchase order in place at the right time. Um, therefore, it's much less likely that they're going to then run a process properly. They're going to have lots of stakeholder pace, which is exactly what was happening in Barclays. And if you start work without a purchase order, really the only person who can push back on that is, is the senior person in the agency. Um, and pushing back on, I think, on, on basic behaviours. So, you know, brief writing is one of the key ones, isn't it? You know, clients on the whole, they don't write very good briefs. They don't take the time. They don't invest in their people in, in it. And then they don't value the difference that it makes for you. And they go through then a series of iterations and come back to a campaign idea. And nobody's looked at the brief or had it in front of them at all. So I think there are some things you can do. So if it's, if it's over the brief writing one, which I do hear a lot, I'm never quite sure why an agency doesn't have the brief sitting in front of them all the time. So every meeting going, guys, we're just going to look at this brief again and we are going to look at this work against this brief or we're going to look at this media plan or whatever is against the brief and everyone signed it off and really challenge the clients to behave in that way, encourage them to get more training, encourage them to evaluate what you're doing. Um, but I think there are times when I just think the senior management of the agency have got to push back and just say no. Um, and it's hard. You know, I had a client last week where we're trying to put in better, in much better process with the clients. And they phoned me up and they said, right, okay, thank you for that process that you're going to do around ways of working, but we want to get started a bit quicker. So we don't want to do all those interview things. We just want to get going. Can we have a workshop next week? And I said, no, you can't. They went, no, well, you don't understand. We need to have it next week. I said, well, that's fine but I'm not going to do it because that doesn't work for us and that's not the process and I'm trying to put in place best practice and by the way, we don't have a purchase order either. So, they went, mm, well, we might have to have somebody else facilitate the workshop. So I said, that's fine. Somebody else can facilitate the workshop. I won't and that'll be fine. Let me know how you get on. About 20 minutes later, I get the head of marketing phoning up going, 
uh, okay, so you won't facilitate a workshop next week. I said, no, I won't, because I'm trying to get you guys to behave properly, and your agency is receiving exactly the same behavior as us, and it can't go on. Okay, so, you know, I did that, and then we were meant to start the interviews, and we didn't have a purchase order. So I phoned them up again and said, we're starting the interviews tomorrow and we don't have a purchase order. I will not let anyone do any interviews if you don't do it. They go, oh, no. amazingly enough, 20 minutes later, we have a purchase order. But it's bloody annoying. You know, and actually, I'm there trying to fix something. So for agencies, really challenging. But I would just stick it out a bit more. But you can only do it if you've got the facts in place. And I think that, you know, fact base, financial base, uh, making them understand the reason for doing it helps them behave better. Hello, I'm Catherine from Arena. Um, I just started at Arena a couple of months ago and I have uh, quite a few new clients that I'm dealing with. Um, one of whom I met at the beginning and has since told me to deal with the heads of departments. He doesn't want to get involved too much in the day to day. I feel like it's an opportunity missed not getting to know him better and I think he's not being fed the right information back. Of quite often. How would you go about um, making a meaningful relationship with him without taking up too much of his time? Uh, I would find a different way to get to him. So if he's a senior client that doesn't want to spend time during the day having a conversation with you, find out what do they like doing. Do they, uh, are they interested in building their profile? Do they, are they members of the Marketing Society? Invite them to that. If, they, if there's an event-based thing, either at the beginning or the end of the day, that they're interested in, try and do something around that. So either invite them to something that they might be interested in yourself or find out where they're going to be and be there as well. Um, and then I think that if you do that enough times, they actually, and, and have, you know, uh, relevant things to do, but don't do a presentation in front of them. And I only say, which of course you would never do, but it has happened to me before. Um, uh, and I would look at trying to do it a bit that way. The other thing to do is to just, um, there are a number of my senior clients when we're running projects that even though they never respond to me, and we kind of agree that, is I leave them voicemails and I send them uh, emails telling them what we're doing without necessarily expecting a response. So I keep them very short. I kind of keep them in the loop. And then when they have a requirement to phone me or speak to me, then I know that they will. And I think that that sort of opens up the door. So rather than doing nothing, I would do something even if you're not getting something in return and wait till you do. Okay. And how you went about becoming um, a trustee for the Macmillan Trust? Um, so I'd been on um, the Board of Refuge and I'd done some work with Scope. Um, then I was ill. And so when I came back to work, in fact, what happened was both... Um, Macmillan and um, oh, the other one, Cancer Research UK, came to me and asked. They were both looking for spaces for um, a trustee. Um, and I don't know if any, are any of you on boards of a, a trustee of a big charity or, or an, another board? A few people. Um, so I had five interviews to um, to become a trustee, which I which I thought was quite a lot, but actually now I see where all the others on the board, they get like seven or eight or nine. There's quite a lot you have to go through. Um, but so they approached me uh, and then I had various interviews and, and decided, but, uh, and I decided for me, Macmillan over cancer research because there was a particular piece that I was passionate about, which was about helping uh, people go back into the workplace when they've had cancer or try and understand post um, having had an illness, about how do you carry on with your life in a different way. Um, and that's what I did. But one of the things that I'm now just looking at is taking on another non-exec. Now I've finished doing the, the chairman of the Marketing Society. And again, it's, um, I think you have to be quite focused. So I would look at what are you really good at? What skills have you got? What do you have a passion for? Um, and then have a look around at doing it. Because actually, for me, well, I'm about to, this afternoon, so I'm going for a day and a half with Macmillan on a, on a strategy day. I spend half a day on a board meeting a month. So it's probably, it's a Sunday, one of my four Sundays a month, half of the Sunday is spent on Macmillan. Um, and probably two journeys, uh, probably one train journey a week. So it's quite a big commitment. 
Hi, I'm Fiona from Naked. Um, you talked about uh, performance equals uh, potential minus interference. Yes. And um, often, like doing a lot of these things, kind of interference can actually be a barrier. Mm -hmm. What would be your advice on trying to identify the kind of your biggest interference factors? So what things getting in the way of kind of achieving all of this? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that it, at an individual level, if you talk to your clients, there tends to be... Um, three main areas. So one is something that's happening at work around the stakeholders. So there will be people or structure or process internally that's getting in the way. So that's the interference for them. Um, then there will be a piece about the job. So the creative campaign, there's, there's some outputs or there's some interference around how do you actually make a process. So you know, some of the conversations you said is about bad, just kind of not the right processes or not the right people or there's, there's some stuff around there. Um, I think then the other, the third piece that's really often we forget is the people side of it. So actually what's happening in their lives. Um, you know, and that interference could be as basic as they only come into the office three days a week because they're at home the other two days. Or they've got young children. Or they've got, you know, parents. Or, you know, the, all, all the normal stuff that we have going on in our lives trying to understand that and factor that in. And it feels quite difficult because often we don't like, um, and we're very English, aren't we? We don't actually talk about the other bits that impact them. Um, uh, but actually, th that is the problem. And I think when you're leading your own team, really understanding what that interference is, um, is really important. So one of the things that we do um, at Oyster Catch is we have managing partners every every other Monday, and we spend the first 10 minutes talking about our personal interference. So, you know, what's happening, what's getting in the way, what are the big things that are coming up uh, within our families, so we can understand the impact that's going to have on us and our, indivi and our individual business. Because actually, it makes a really, really big, big difference. Um, you know, if, if I know what's going to happen with Ang Angus, is about to have a, his wife's about to have a baby, so that's going to impact us and our workload and our workflow. But it might equally be my daughter's just had her GCSEs. So, you know, there's some of that stuff. And then the other piece is just looking at what is their motivator. So ask them the question, um, what makes you comfortable? So, you know... If you know what it is that's going to make them feel good, then you know what's getting in the way. So of, of my business partners, Richard likes writing charts. He likes things being really detailed and written down and organized. And he gets it's a lot of interference for him if that doesn't happen. Peter doesn't like status meetings on Monday because he doesn't like talking about money. So, you know, we have to make those into kind of hero meetings for him because otherwise he feels very uncomfortable and that gets in the way of him being able to deliver stuff. Um, Angus, what does he like? Angus just wants to get on with stuff. So, really, he hasn't got time to waste. So, and he's very like that with his clients. So, he, so I will try and make sure I can understand for him how that's happening. And I just want to know what's going on. And if I don't know what's going on, I feel very uncomfortable. And then I can't. Yeah, it's too much interference for me. Okay. One last question. Got a, one last question? Yes, of course you can. Go on then. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Laura from Naked. Um, it is an enormous question, so I guess it's probably just an initial reaction to the question. But women in marketing, I, I would just love to know your opinion on that. Quite big, isn't it? Um, do you know, it is, I sort of oscillate a bit on this, but it is unbelievably frustrating that we don't have more women on boards. I get all the reasons why. I can absolutely, we spend lots of time with companies where they want to have more women on the board, and it just hasn't happened. Um, and, you know, there's lots of conversation around should you have that kind of policy or not. Um, I think, and, and the same is, is in marketing. Um, personally, I think on the board point, my standpoint is you should positively discriminate to make sure that you have equal weighting of men and women on lists, but you should actually only appoint based on merit. Um, I, and, I think, and I think that's the, the case in marketing as well. Um, in terms of behaviour... 
I think it's important for women and some men, but I think you know there is a difference, which is to understand how we behave and, and recognise that we do behave differently. So books like Sheryl Sundberg's Lean In are good because it kind of puts a reflection on ourselves and makes you think you either agree with what she says or you don't, but at least you have a point of view about it. Um, and I was with uh, a client last week talking about how she was going to restructure what she wanted to do, and she has some ideas for the restructuring of the organisation. She currently has two bosses um, who are the board representatives for marketing. Um, and so she talked me through all of the issues that they had. Um, I said, okay, we'll put the facts against it, you could do this. Uh, and then I said, and then how are you going to put that into the board? Because maybe you could go to the chief exec, but it's probably quite a big play. They have a non-exec who has a marketing background, who's the chief exec of another company. So I said, well, that's a really good route in. So she talked me through all that. And I said, look, I really don't want to be sexist, but if you were my male counterpart sitting there as marketing director, you would have had that conversation by now. So don't be scared of it. You've got to go and do it. And she, and she kind of laughed and said, you know, you're absolutely right. So... I think sometimes we don't help ourselves, um, but I think everything you can do for yourself and for your teams to get people to understand what their strengths and weaknesses, regardless of whether they're women or not, is the way that we're going to get the absolute best people to the top. And there is no doubt, we know this, it is, makes much more sense to have equal numbers of men and women and all sorts of ethnic minorities running companies than there is to have you know, it all being a, a male thing.